Hello, I'm Brad Phillips here with Puppy Steps Training. Today I have Louie with me. Uh, he's one of my personal puppies, and so I'm a little bit partial, but I think Louie is super handsome and just a really fun dog. I think you're gonna love having him around. Uh, I've really enjoyed training him. Um, like I said, I just think he's a, a really great dog. He's very, very smart, uh, definitely very methodical, and so he's gonna be one that you, you have to keep up with, because if not, he is definitely going to think that he can kind of rule the house. Uh, he's just, like I said, very, very smart and very quick to figure out um, what's going on. So as long as you're going to step into this knowing that you need to be the leader, you need to establish a relationship with him, and that relationship has to be built on respect for you, uh, he's going to be awesome. He's just such a such fun dog. So. With that, we're gonna jump right into the demonstration. First, I'm gonna talk about how to develop that relationship, how to make sure that he understands your expectations and all this training to transition over. Um, so I'm gonna give you what I call our three secrets to success. Uh, as long as you follow through with those three things, Louis is gonna be phenomenal. He's just, like I said, a very, very fun dog. Uh, then we're gonna pull him out. We'll show you his manners, his obedience commands, crate training, house training, uh, then we'll go for a walk and do his leash work, and we'll talk about some engagement and socialization in there as well. So, but before I get him out, three secrets. Uh, first one's consistency. You have to be consistent with Louie across the board. That's consistently rewarding and correcting. You need to teach him what your expectations are, uh, and then you need to follow through. So follow through is our second one, and then we'll talk about management, which is our third. So consistency. Consistency has to be across the board. So with the whole family, everybody has to have high expectations for Louie. If you set those expectations high, he's gonna live up to them. But if you set your expectations low, he's gonna live up to them. And once you have low expectations, your dog is gonna think that they are the leader. <clears throat> so consistently reward and correct. You need to teach him what the correct behaviors are. And you need to show him that your expectations are the same as mine. You should expect the, this high level of obedience and manners uh, when he gets home. Uh, you need to, once again, teach him that you have the same expectations. So we do that by reinforcing good behaviors. Uh, when he does something good or he does something correct, whether it's, uh, you know, we're practicing stays or he comes up and greets me, I'm going to mark that behavior and reward it. So okay is our marker. When I say okay, he knows he did the correct behavior and then he's finished and some type of reward is gonna follow. We do use uh, treats fairly heavy at this age because he is a puppy and he's very, very food motivated. And so that's his currency. That's what he wants to work for. That's what he likes. Uh, you don't get to pick what your dog likes. So Louis loves treats. So I am going to, when he does something right, I'm gonna, okay, good boy, and I'm gonna give him a treat. Uh, now you're not always gonna have treats on you, and so we do use praise and affection uh, as means to a reward, as well as if I'm playing with him, that toy is a reward. If I'm working with him, I ask him to drop it, I'll throw the toy, and that way he, he gets it back, and that's rewarding to him. But over the next couple months, as he matures, he's gonna be growing, so they have a higher food drive. So use food. Um, like I said, that's his currency. That's what he wants to work for. So try and be pretty consistent. Try and be very consistent with giving him a very high value reward. <clears throat> You'll also notice that I'm gonna catch him doing good things. So while we're doing this demonstration, if he's just planted here, he shows that he's in control, I might slip him a couple treats and I'm gonna reinforce this behavior because what gets reinforced gets replicated. And so I want him in control. I wanna teach him that, hey, I like this. This is a good behavior, keep offering it. Um, so, so that's consistently rewarding. Now you also have to be consistent in correcting him. This is where we teach him, once again, what our expectations are. So if Louis does something um, naughty or, or bad, I'm gonna correct him. My correction is not a physical or a really firm correction. Like if I'm just working with him or practicing stays and he breaks, I'm just gonna do something like, no, and I'll walk towards him and I'll have him do that behavior again. Um, couple things there. One, you notice that it was just my inflection. That's all that changes. Uh, and he's reading, he's reading that voice inflection, my body language, and that shows him that he did an incorrect behavior. Um, 
The other thing is I am going to put him back in that same spot and have him do it again. I will never end on an incorrect behavior. Even if I have to back it way down and we get a very simple behavior, I'm going to end on a positive, uh, correct, um, correct repetition because I want to reinforce that. I want to show him that, hey, you can't get away with doing the incorrect thing because gonna, we're going to keep working at it until you get it right. Now, I'm not going to push my dog to, where, to the point where they break down, but once again, I just want to teach him that my expectation is that we do the correct behavior. Uh, now, if he does something a little bit more serious, like maybe he started having an accident, that's like the scariest I get with that correction. I might clap, I might stomp, and I'll just say, no, 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 and I'm just going to grab him and we're gonna run outside. The point there is to almost startle him to the point where he stops peeing, and then we rush him outside and give him an opportunity to go. Now, if I correct him that heavy, then I am gonna take him outside, and as soon as he finishes going to the bathroom, then I'm gonna heavily reward him. So that way I'm teaching him like, no, this wasn't correct, but this is, this is the good behavior, good boy, and I'm going to, once again, um, reward that behavior. The only type of physical correction we use is a leash correction, and it's just two pops on the leash. I'm not yanking him around. I don't want to inflict any harm. I'm just going to do two quick pops to regain his attention to then change his behavior. Um, so right along with consistency is our second secret to success, which is follow through. So when I correct him, I expect him to then do the correct behavior. So in an instance where you know, I might not be right next to him. Uh, that's when I have to follow through. If you don't follow through after you correct him and you let him get away with doing that incorrect behavior with an, a very intelligent dog like Louie, he's thinking like, oh, I guess I don't have to listen in this instance. Uh, that's also why we have a rule of one and done. I'm gonna ask him to do something once and I'm gonna allow him to process it. And then if he doesn't do it, I'm gonna enforce the behavior. So. A good example is, say you're in the kitchen cooking, you see Louie and he goes and tries to jump up on the couch and your rules are no dogs on the couch. I tell him, Louie, off, and I expect him to get right down. But if he had two paws up there and he just kind of looked at you, like, what are you gonna do about it? At that point, I am going to walk over, say no, and I'm going to remove him. That's follow through. He doesn't get away with um, testing those boundaries. The worst thing you could do, once again, this is why we have one and done, is sit there and go, no, Louie, off, off, Louie, off, off, because then he's, he's relying on that word, and now he's learning that maybe off doesn't mean to get down, uh, or maybe I don't have to listen until the sixth time he says it. So that's why I say it once. If he doesn't uh, respond, I follow through. Same thing with like a recall command. I'll have him on that long lead, I'll call him to come, and if he hesitates or he tries to keep going, I'm gonna say no and I'm gonna reel him in. So that way I follow through and I teach him that he's not allowed to get away with disobeying. Um, and then the third one is management. So management just means maintaining control. If I have control of my dog, I can stop bad habits from ever forming. I can teach him what the rules are in my house. Uh, I can be really consistent because I have him under control. Now with management and follow through, we're gonna talk a lot about it throughout the demo because it's intertwined, well, it's all intertwined with everything we do, but each manner, there's, there's different ways to manage it. There's really good management, there's poor management, and we'll touch base on that. But just real quick, I'll give you a, a quick example of management so you know coming in. Um, an example of poor management is with house training. So he's doing really, really well here, but you're taking him from a familiar environment and putting him in an unfamiliar environment. So if you take him home and you think, oh, this dog should be good, we just house trained him here, we spent all this money, right? If you give him free access to your whole house, I can promise you, you're gonna have issues because he doesn't know um, where he's supposed to go to the bathroom, where the bells are, uh, what door he's supposed to use. Like there's so many things that you have to teach him. Like this is our routine, this is, this is my expectations for my house, this is where we go to the bathroom. So if you just give him free reign, you have a dog that's stressed out in an unfamiliar environment that's likely to have an accident. So that's poor management. Good management would be understanding that he's gonna be stressed and we're in an unfamiliar environment. So the first day, we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that we take him outside every 30 minutes just to establish a routine. Now it's not gonna be that often um, as you go through the next couple weeks, but understanding that this transition period that takes two to four months, or I mean, sorry, 
uh, two to four weeks, I'm going to give him 100% supervision. He does not leave my, my field of view. I know what he's doing, where he's at, uh, all of that at all times. And if I can't give him that attention, I'm going to put him in a crate because that way he's confined. He can't get out. He can't have an accident. He can't chew something up. So that's good management. I'm preparing for the inevitable that he's going to be stressed and that he's in a, an unfamiliar environment. So by managing it, I'm managing his surroundings, I'm maintaining control of him, and I'm able to teach him what my expectations are. So hopefully that makes sense. Like I said, I'll touch on this throughout the whole demonstration. Um, but with that, I am going to pull Louie out now, and we're going to go through his manners. So the first manner you are going to see is his gates and his doorways. So anytime Louie comes out of the crate, we go through a closed door, we go through an outside gate, uh, and you can create this with any doorway. I expect him to hold an automatic stay. Now, he's gonna take a little bit of time to generalize, and so once again, you're gonna have to reinforce this behavior. He knows that when I open that crate door, he has to wait. He knows that when I open this house door, he has to wait, as well as the door over here and over here, uh, because we've created those expectations. Now, when you add a new level of distractions or a new environment, prepare that he might break. He doesn't, he needs to know what your expectations are. So in this case, when I open that crate, you'll see me kind of open it slowly. And if he tries to break, I might just close it on him. Maybe lift my leg up and block him, something like that. Or when I walk out this side door, I'm not just gonna flip it open and test him if there's a new distraction. Instead, I might put myself in a position where I can open it. And if he tries to break, I can lift my leg up and block him or I'll have a hold of that leash, and if he tries to break, I'll say no and pop him twice. So once again, that's, that's managing that behavior, and we're creating, um, we're creating an environment where he can understand our expectations. So I'm gonna grab this leash here, because uh, this is another really important management tool. I will have him drag a leash around for the first month, so that if I need to quickly grab him, I have that ability. So we're gonna let him out. Yeah. Okay, good boy. You can see that he, he just kind of stuck that front paw out. And so all I had to do was step in and say, ah, and he, he slid it back in. He knows what the behavior is or he knows my expectations. And that was, just a simple correction. Louie. So I will show you uh, this house door in a little while. Uh, good boy. When we go outside. Um, but every time. Come here. Good dog. When I open this crate. Okay. Good boy. I expect him to hold that stay. Now, our next manner is his greeting. So you'll see when I called him over up here, he immediately came and sat down. So if I actually call him over, Louie, I'm just going to wait until he sits. Good boy. And then I can pet him. I can reward him. All that. Good boy. So this is his greeting. Anytime you've been away or you're letting him out of the crate and he's really excited or you call him over um, and he's a little bit excited, wait for him to get under control. So I'm gonna wait for this, this greeting. I expect him to sit. That's him showing me that uh, he respects me, he's in control, and he's waiting for me to either give him a command or, or to say hi. Oh, good boy. But that way, it's a replacement behavior, so he's not gonna be jumping on me. Uh, instead, he sits down and makes eye contact. Louie. Now, good boy. He, uh, he has to learn to respect you, and so we're going to do a simple exercise for a day or two just to really establish this relationship. So when I do this exercise, come here. Uh, I'm going to put him in front of me. I'm going to take a few steps back, say his name, and expect him to sit. The first time you do this, I'll ask him to sit. So Louie, and then I might ask him, sit. Okay, good boy. And then I'll do it again. Louie, come here. And if he doesn't immediately sit, I'll ask him, go boy. Louie. So this is also, nope, don't guess. Come here. This is a good way for name recognition. And then, okay, good boy, we're establishing a pattern. 
So he knows that any time I call him over, I'm not going to give him any attention until he's planted. That's a good boy. Yes, that's a good boy. Now, I want this to become an expectation with each person we meet, whether they're a stranger or someone he knows. Uh, but why he's a puppy, that's hard to do. So you're going to have to work on this. So anytime you meet a stranger that wants to see your dog, uh, tell them that he's got to sit for you first. So, and you can do this like when you introduce your friends for the first time. So if I had someone that wanted to see him, I would call him over, Louie. I would ask him to sit or wait for him to sit, pet him a little bit, and then you could invite someone over to, to pet him. But Louie has to know that he, he has to be in control in order to meet new people. No, he didn't, didn't quite hit it. He, he notioned towards the bell, so okay, outside. So I'm going to take him out to the bathroom. And you can see he doesn't have to sit, but he has to show me that he's in control when going through a doorway. Okay. Outside. Okay, good outside, good boy. Good boy. Same thing going in. Okay, good boy. Shows me that he's in control. Now we'll talk about his house training here in a little bit. Um, oh, good boy. So yeah, just ex expect him to be in control, do that little exercise. Like I said, it's a good name recognition tool. He's also getting used to the way that you say things, the way that you mark behaviors, all of that. <clears throat> now, mealtime manners, which anytime that I feed Louie, I expect him to hold a sit-stay. Now, this should be automatic because we do it so often that usually I, if I shake the bowl, he's going to plant. Now, I don't have to tell him to stay. He should just do it. Okay, good boy. Now you'll notice that he kind of flinched. Yeah, good boy. So I was a little bit, I kind of hesitated um, just to make sure he was planted. Now, um, this is a really good way to build a relationship with him. You'll also notice that he's very comfortable with me taking it away. I can also handle him when he eats. Louis is, like I said in the beginning, very food driven or, or motivated by food. And so a lot of times we actually feed him with a slow feeding bowl uh, to slow him down because otherwise he will just inhale his food. Um, and same thing with treats. We've worked a lot on his mouth handling and gently because he is so food motivated. So, um, but anytime we feed him, I expect him to hold that sit stay. Uh, and I would practice that a few times. And it's not a bad idea to get a slow feeding bowl. Louis. Now, like I said, um, he's super food motivated. So gently is a command that we've, we've really been working on. If I go to give him a treat or give him anything and he lunges up, come here. Uh, I am going to pull that back and say gently, come here. And tipped right over, didn't you? And I can lower that slow, good boy. And I expect him uh, to be fairly cautious with his treat or with his teeth. Um, but you'll notice he loves his food. So if, if he got really kind of piranha jaws on me, nope, gently, I will pull that away. And now I'm going to tuck it in my fist so that he can't get it. And he's got to show me that he's going to be nice, good boy, and use his tongue. If, if he lunges at me or tries to eat my hand, it's immediately gently. And then I'm going to, hey, it's right here. Go slow, gently. Good, good. And see that, then he slows down. But he does need a reminder on that because, like I said, very food motivated and sometimes forgets that he has teeth. And we want to make sure that he understands that. Huh. Now, we handle him fairly frequently. I'm going to check his teeth. Huh. Good boy. I can handle his paws his ears, 
pet his sides, lift him up. I want to make sure that he's not going to be aggressive um, or defensive. Good boy. Good boy. His only thing is sometimes he likes to mouth, and so we're not, not going to let him mouth. So if he tried to mouth on me, if he tried to stick my hand in his mouth, a couple things that I'll do. One is if my hand actually goes in his mouth, I might just grab his bottom jaw like this and tell him no. Uh, or if he stuck like my sweater or uh, the leash or my shoelaces, anything like that in his mouth, I'm gonna quickly grab his muzzle and tell him no. Wait for a second. He shows me he's in control. I'll go back to petting him. He tried it again, I'm gonna no. And now I'm gonna remove myself. Um, because the reason he's mouthing is he wants more. He likes whatever we're doing or he wants to play. And so by me removing that, that's a correction because now he doesn't get uh, what he was initially wanting to do. Now, Louis has not lost very many of his teeth, so he has to chew. Um, there's no avoiding that behavior. Huh. Good boy. So you're going to want to give him appropriate things to chew on because you have to teach him what he's allowed to chew on and what he's not in your home. Uh, so one of the best ways to do this is obviously avoid it. Um, avoid giving him access to things he's not allowed to chew on and give him access to things he is. But that's not really possible in your home. There's always something he has access to, whether that be a table leg, a pillow, a couch, something like that. So if he went over and he started chewing on something he wasn't supposed to, I would tell him no, and then I would replace it. I would give him something he's allowed to chew on in a similar texture or consistency. So if he wanted to chew on a couch or a, a pillow or something soft, I would give him something soft like that plush toy. If he wants to chew on something hard like a table leg, I'll give him a bully stick. If he wants to chew on shoelaces, give him a rope. But try and match that need because he's chewing based on what he feels like his mouth needs, whether he needs something hard to really get into or something soft. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Also, though, uh, boredom causes chewing it causes all destructive behaviors so that's why i say just give him random things throughout the day to chew on uh, also a tired dog is a less destructive dog so if you can give him plenty of exercise give him something to do uh, also something to keep his brain you know mentally stimulating that's going to help avoid those destructive behaviors but just understand that he has to chew you cannot avoid those behaviors so give him an appropriate outlet Boy. Now, when he has something, I can ask him to drop it. So when he gets back here, I'll show you. Um, if he has a toy like this, if I'm playing with it, I can take a hold and I can tell him, drop it. Good boy. Good boy. And I expect him to physically release it. Uh, you will notice I'll give him a second to think about it, and sometimes they got to work it out of their mouth. Uh, also, these plush toys will get caught on teeth. Drop it. Good boy. Good boy. And if I have a toy, 99% of the time, the toy is a reward. He drops it, he gets the toy back. Sometimes I might even ask him to uh, here, here, drop it just to give it back to him. Yeah, good boy. Now, one thing, if you're not playing tug with him, like if you're uh, wanting him to drop something, don't do this. Don't try and pull it from him because then it's a game, which he loves the game tug but I need him to know that if I ask him, drop it, good boy, good boy, yes, good boy. If I need him to drop it, he has to let go. Now, when I'm playing with him, I like to take a hold of it because um, I do eventually want to teach my dog to bring things to hand. Uh, he likes to take things to his bed. That's why I'm standing over here because he just wants to lay down and chew on it. But I can ask him, from a step away. Louis, drop it. No. So he kind of hesitated, didn't look at me. So I'm gonna take it away. Come here. Now I'm gonna make him earn it back. He did actually let go of it. I thought he still had a hold of it, but then, but I'm gonna make him earn it. Okay, good boy. And I'm gonna throw it. So we're gonna do that again. Louis, drop it. Thank you. 
Now, um, if he didn't drop it, if he just completely just kept chewing on it, I would come over and I would tell him no, and then I would remove it. So first thing I'm gonna do is just take a hold of it and hold it still, and a lot of times he's just gonna let go. But if he didn't, ah, don't chew on your leash. Then I would just wrap his muzzle, like I would grab around his muzzle and wrap his lips around his canines. Uh, or I'll slip my thumb in there and press down on his tongue. Good boy, good boy. Drop it. No, Louie, drop it. Good boy, good boy. And see, that was, that was my correction there. He walked away from me, so I said, no, drop it. Outside, you got to poop now? No, tried to walk through the doorway, simple leash correction. Okay, now we go through. Okay. All right. We're going to get him some water. He started eating some snow out there, so I think he might just be a little thirsty. Okay, so also with Louie, um, anytime he plays with children, I always have the kids have a toy because he's gonna wanna play along and kids are like the greatest game to a dog. They run, they squeal, they make a lot of noise and it's just a lot of fun to chase them. And kids always wanna run away from a dog. So if they have a toy, this provides a form of redirection. So one, Louie's not going to grab a pant leg. He's going to go for the toy. And if you get a kid that's maybe a little bit nervous of, that to of your puppy, they can throw the toy and direct him away. So that way, redirection. You are very loud, huh? Loud drinker. Um, so yeah, always use that toy as a form of redirection. Um, not that Louie's a, a scary puppy by any means, but sometimes kids are just a little bit nervous when a puppy comes running towards them. And the last manner is jumping. I mentioned it with that follow through, but our command is off. So that's whether he jumps on me, he jumps on another person, a couch, anything he's not allowed to get on, I tell him off and I expect him to get down immediately. And this is one that's very, very big on follow through. Like I said, if he jumps up on the couch and you say off and he doesn't immediately get down, you go and you remove him. Uh, he does not get away with disobeying. Now, I don't care what your rules are. If he's allowed on the couch, great. If he's only allowed on certain furniture, you have to teach that. My dogs know that um, they're only allowed on invitation. Oh, good boy. And you can teach that invitation. But for here, it's, it's a no jumping policy. Now, if you were playing with him, you were outside, he's running around all crazy, and you call him over and you think, oh, he might jump on me. It is so important, and this is especially important for children, but if he's running at you and you think he might jump, never step backwards. As soon as you step back, now it's a game. Now he's gonna try and jump even more. Instead, I'll always step into my dog. I'm showing him that, hey, I'm the boss. You're not allowed to jump on me. Uh, and I restrict the space, which in the end throws off their timing. The other thing is when I step into him, I'm gonna prepare to bring my knee up and block him. Uh, I want to catch him in the chest. I'm not trying to punt him across the room. It's just going to be a no off and I'm going to block him and I'm going to ignore him until he sits. But if he comes barreling up and he tries to jump and I knock him back and tell him off and then he comes up and just sits down, then I'm going to reward that behavior. That way I reinforce it. Okay, good boy, because that's what I expect him to do. Um, so the other thing is as you bring him home, if he does show that he's struggling with like one person, which sometimes happens, uh, dogs associate them with like being lower in the pack order, I'll take that leash and I'll work on this command or this uh, manner. So I have that person call him over, I walk him up, if he tries to jump, I tell him, 
no, off, pop, pop on the leash, and we turn around and walk away, and then we repeat. And so we'll practice this uh, until he does approach and sits down. So I believe that is uh, all of our manners. So we are going to move on to his obedience commands now. Drop it. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Huh, come here. Come here. So uh, our first three are, uh, sorry, our first three do have hand signals. So sit is that scoop over the nose, which I showed you. Hey, Louie. So it's just a scoop over the nose. Uh, stay is a stop sign and down. I take my hand and put my palm down. So we have both a sit and a down stay. Hey, come here. You losing focus. So if he's losing focus like this, you'll notice I put the leash down and now I'm standing on it. So that way he can't run away. So first thing, you saw that sit command, just a scoop over the nose. Now I'm going to tell him to stay. Louis, stay. Now, because he's a little distracted, that's why I got his attention back by saying his name and then asked for that stay. And I kind of trapped myself in a corner a little bit. Ah, nope. So that, I got it a little too close. Now we're gonna do it again. Nope, sit, stay. You'll notice that I, I mean, I said ah. Uh, it wasn't a crazy physical correction, but I just got that treat a little too close, a little too distracting with the amount of time. So now we're gonna reset it, and I'll drop a treat a little closer to me. Of course, he's showing that he's, he's not focusing. There we go. Okay, good boy, good boy, good boy, good boy. So you'll notice just like that, uh, the first one was a little too hard, getting the treat that close to him. Second one, I dropped it a little closer to me, took a few steps back, made sure I got the correct behavior, still increasing distractions. Sit. Down. Like I said, our, our down is here. If he's gonna be a little hesitant, a couple different things that I'll do where I'm already standing on his leash. I can just put a little bit of leash pressure and he'll go, nope, he was going down. Good, stay. You'll notice that I didn't sit there and repeat myself though. I gave him that body language, I slid the leash back, I expected the correct behavior. I gave him, him an opportunity to process it. <clears throat> With the Griffons, they are very smart and they will try and find what they believe is the best way to do something. So you do have to allow them to process it um, because they're, they're such a methodical dog. add some distractions. Okay, good boy. So just to give you a, a little background here. So Louis is, is very smart and he started to figure out that he could manipulate uh, two of my trainers. And so he thought that if he would wait because he was being a little bit sticky with the down, he, he learned it very quickly but then he learned that if he waited long enough, they would put the food lure in their hand and take him down. See, and then he'd pop back, back up, he'd get the treat, and then he thought he was done, huh? And so that's why that's, that food lure is now my, my last resort if he's a little sticky on the down, because you'll notice how quickly he went down as soon as I huh, lower that food past his face. He'll go, he'll go right down. So instead, that's why I use this leash, Louie. And I'll ask him, hey, get his attention here. We're losing focus. Louie, sit. And so I'll take that leash and step on it and drag it back towards me and tell him down and he'll slide in. Stay. 
Okay, good boy. So we've been really working on these stays. He has really great stays up past 20 seconds easy. Um, but don't be satisfied with them. Always try to improve. You want your toy? Uh, we add what we call the three Ds. That's distance, distraction, duration. Uh, those are our three Ds. We want to always improve. Don't, don't ever be satisfied where he's at. So Louis breaks his stays on a daily basis because I'm always trying to improve. <clears throat> um, add new distractions, make it harder. If he breaks once or twice, we'll reset, do it over again. If he breaks a third time in a row, then I know that that distraction's too hard or I'm, mi I'm giving him some sort of miscue or miscommunication. And so we're gonna reset it, we're gonna make sure we get a positive and then build back up. I never want him to fail more than three times in a row because then he's gonna get frustrated and you're gonna get frustrated. So always try to improve, but also keep in mind that what he was able to do yesterday, he may not be able to do today. Uh, so there's some variability there. We will always wanna train to success, not to failure, and always improve. There's a lot of hills and valleys in dog training, but we want that progression to be up, right? Huh, you good boy, good boy. Uh, the other thing that I should have mentioned earlier is these griffs. You cannot have a heavy hand. Uh, as soon as you get frustrated and you start giving more of a firm correction, you will shut these dogs down. They are not a dog that you can apply a lot of pressure really fast, and you, like I said, you can't have a heavy hand. So um, if you do have any questions with the stays or any of these, feel free to, to give me a call. Louie, come here. So our next two commands are place commands. We have the actual place command, which I'll just take him close by. Louie, place. Now I don't care what position he's in, as long as all four paws are on the object that I told him to go to. Right now he's on his bed, it's a perfect elevated place. We can also use rugs or towels or anything that has a defined edge. Now it's an automatic stay, he will wait until released. Okay, good boy. Uh, he also, place, gets the treat when he's on, um, not when he comes off. Now, I will use the word like good boy or something like that, help him settle. Uh, that's more of like a, you're doing the right thing command, good boy. And then I can, I can even come in and give him a treat, pet him, pet him. Those are all really good distractions. And if he tried to step off, I'd just tell him no and, and reset. But you'll notice I don't care that he's standing. Um, he can be standing, sitting, laying down, doesn't matter. And he will just settle in. He'll do a couple minutes on, on that bed. And that's just the place command. Okay, good boy, good boy. Place. So you'll notice he's reading my body language and that's why I'll step uh, close to it. We're working on adding that distance. Uh, that's something that you can easily do. Okay, good boy. Okay. So very similar is the crate command. I can just tell him, Louie, crate. Good boy. And I expect him to go in and turn around. He's also expected to stay. Okay, good boy. Crate. Good dog. Give him the treat when he goes in, not when he comes out. Throw a treat on the ground there. Okay, good boy. Uh, now, if he ever got sticky or hesitated with this, I would just tap on the top. You're ready for a bigger crate. Huh? huh? Now, the crate command, you need to practice a lot. Okay, good boy. Because if you only use the crate command when you lock him up, he will figure that out and he will not want to go in because he will, hey, gently, he will associate it with being locked up. You'll also notice that this crate door is not the release. Okay, good boy, good boy. Now I'm gonna do it one more time. He got a little bit mouthy there, so I wanna make sure that he's gonna be uh, gentle with it. See, in this, you can tell how smart he is, and he just tries to guess. He's like, all right, what do you want me to do next? 
and it'll just start offering rewards. So I'm going to show this. Come here. Sit. Good boy. Crate. Gently. Good. You'll also notice I say good or good boy when he goes in. Um, I'm not going to use that marker word until he's released. Okay, good boy. I also want to show you when I give him treats, because like I said, he gets a little bit mouthy sometimes, I'm putting that treat in the palm of my hand and then using my thumb to hold on to it. That way when I give it to him, it's covered and he has to use his tongue. Good dog, good dog. So, um, the next command we'll do is a leave it command. I'm gonna grab something for him to leave. We'll pull out the good stuff. How about that? So I've been letting him eat some treats off the ground. So now I'm going to drop one and ask him to leave it. And I'm going to give him some cheese. A little bit higher value of a reward here. So I'm going to, because he's, he's real hyper right now and he's not focusing um, super great, I'm going to take a hold of the leash. And that way I have a form of management. So I drop this treat. Good boy. Good boy. Now I'm going to pull him away just a little bit. Louie. And watch. Now we're going to walk past it. So he want, he sees the treat. See, he wants to get to it. I'm going to tell him, leave it. Good boy. And he just walked right past it. Good dog. And now once I tell him, leave it, it is forever forbidden. He is not allowed to get that treat. Now this is our one exception to the one and done policy. Um, this one I will repeat myself if he tries to lunge. Come here, Louis. Good dog, but you can see he chose to just walk past it. Leave it. Good dog. You'll also notice though, like I said, I got this cheese and I'll use hot dogs as well. So I'm using a higher reward than what's on the ground. So that way it's better for him to leave it because he gets something even better. Uh, come here. Leave it. Good boy. Good boy. And then I can pick it up and remove it. So leave it means leave it forever. Uh, now with a treat, I can throw it back in and, and we'll use that later. But Louis, uh, this is a great command for if you're cooking, you spill something that you don't want him to get. Come here. Uh, I can tell him leave it and then clean it up. So I only use leave it for something that I can remove or I can remove Louie from. You're just trying to guess what, you, what I want you to do, huh? Good boy. Louie, place. Good dog. So I'm going to give him something to chew on for a second. Like I said, it's only, I'm gonna see, good. Just waiting for him to see if he's gonna break. So I only use leave it with something I can remove or I can remove Louie from. So if he's chewing on a baseboard, you're not gonna use leave it. That's a just no, because at some point he's gonna have access to that baseboard again, right? We don't wanna ruin the integrity of that command. <clears throat> I use leave it a lot on our walks when there's like some roadkill or something, I'll tell him. Leave it, and then it's, okay, good boy, okay, good boy, and I'll jackpot reward him. This is also a good reason that even with my adult dogs, if uh, when we go for walks, I mean, there's, there's a difference between us going on a hike and a, or hunting. There, there's something else for the reward. But if I'm going on a walk through the neighborhood, I'll carry some, some jerky or some treats with me, even though Allie's you know, seven, Stella's four, but that way, if there is some sort of heavy distraction or something I need them to leave or, you know, a cat or a, another jogger, I have something that's high value that I can redirect them. So, uh, and I can use that leave it command if there's something that I don't want them to pick up. Uh, so the, the last two commands are watch me and come. I'm going to cover those with our leash work. So, um, here in just a few minutes. 
But while he's just relaxing, chewing on that bully stick, I want to talk about crate training uh, and house training. <clears throat> so we spent a lot of time on the crate. Uh, he's very comfortable in there. Louis is sleeping eight hours through the night, no problem. We put him to bed at 10 and get him up at six. Now you can adjust that to fit your schedule, but just know that his, <clears throat> excuse me, his internal alarm is gonna be going off at 6 a.m. saying, hey, I need to go to the bathroom and it's time to eat. Because we are also feeding him at roughly 6.30 in the morning and 6 p.m. Um, now the morning feeding is variable. And that one you can just feed when you're ready. The evening I do try and stick to as close to six as possible because we put him in the crate at 10. I want a good four hours for him to clear his system. Also with water, I make sure that that's taken away by eight. Um, once again, just so he can clear everything out. <clears throat> now also just real quick with the food. So we're feeding him in about a cup, cup and a half morning and night. Um, he, he kind of hit a growth spurt where we upped it and now we're kind of taking it back down. So just kind of watch him, uh, but a, between a cup and a cup and a half is perfect morning and night. With water, you don't want to give him full access to water during this transition because a stressed out dog will drink a lot more and then you just open the floodgates. Like he's going to have to pee a, a lot more, which the transition because of the stress causes the dog to have to go to the bathroom more frequently anyway. Uh, so if you let him inhale a whole bunch of water, uh, he's going to have to pee every 10 minutes, which is what we don't want. So you're going to want to give him water with meals and a couple times throughout the day. Now, going back with the crate. So he'll sleep through the night, 10 to 6, no problem. The first night, it's not a bad idea just to set an alarm and let him out at you know, 1 or 2 in the morning. Just because of the stress, I just don't want to push him to have an accident. I would rather let him out give him a, a quick bathroom break and put him away versus have to clean up an accident in the morning. Uh, the transition, like I said, causes them to have to go to the bathroom more frequently and a lot of times they will get a loose stool. So in the crate, I would rather just give him a, a quick break. After that, he should go back to sleeping 10 to six, no problem. Louis is also good to spend you know, four hours at a time in the crate during the day. So one four hour block, you can also you know, put him in other times throughout the day. But, four hours is his max during the day without needing a break. <clears throat> now, if he, if he makes some noise, so he hasn't thrown any fits in the crate for quite a while, but like I said, now you're taking him home, it's a stressful transition, and he'll probably be enjoying your company, and then you're gonna put him in the crate, and he's gonna go, wait a second, I, wa I wanna be with you. And so then they might throw a little temper tantrum. A lot of this is also just to see what your reaction is gonna be. So the worst thing you could do is go and let him out of the crate when he's crying. Instead, if I put him in the crate and he starts crying, I'm gonna ignore it. Uh, if you come over and you console him, that's like the second worst thing you could do. If I come over and I'm like, oh, it's okay, Louie, I'll let you out in a minute. Then he's learning, he's learning. If I throw a fit, they're either gonna let me out or they're gonna come and pay attention to me. So instead, we ignore that behavior. If I need to, I'll cover him with a blanket. Dogs are, are like parrots. If they can't see what's going on, then they're just gonna settle down. Uh, you can prepare for him to throw a little outburst the first time you put him in there. And I might just give him a, a bully stick so that he can just relax. Um, but he shouldn't have any issues. If you are about to let him out and you're walking over to the crate and he started making some noise, started barking at you, you're gonna want to uh, ignore that. So just, even if I wait like five or 10 seconds and then let him out, but I need that silence before I open the crate. Uh, that way, once again, he just doesn't think that he can get away with throwing a little temper tantrum. Uh, also, because he is chewing so much, he's teething, I am not putting anything in the bottom of the crate because he will immediately go for tags, so. All right, so house training. House training is a big one. We spent a ton of time on this and Louis is awesome. He's doing so good. But now you're taking him from, an, uh, from a familiar environment and putting him in an unfamiliar environment. So you have got to teach him that your expectations are the same at your house as they are here. You need to show him where the bells are and where he's allowed to go to the bathroom. Uh, if you don't, if you take him home and you just give him free access to your entire house, you're gonna have issues. 
Uh, instead, we have to be consistent and we have to teach him and give him plenty of opportunities to go. So first things first, right when you get home, you are going to take him to the area you want him to go to the bathroom and he is going to go to the bathroom before you ever step foot in your house. Uh, that gives you a second to breathe as well as an opportunity to uh, teach the bells uh, fairly quick. So, um, when, when we target the bells, we're going to take him out every 30 minutes. So the first 24 hours, I will take him over, he will ring the bells, we will go to the bathroom every 30 minutes. The exception here is if he's in the crate or he's passed out of sleep. Uh, I'll just wait till he either wakes up or we get him out in that case. But if he is outside of the crate and up and moving, every 30 minutes he is going to the bells and going outside. Uh, day number two, so for the next 24 hours, you're going to lengthen it to 45 minutes. Every 45 minutes, just set an alarm, take him over, he rings the bells, we go outside, go to the bathroom. On day three, uh, we go to an hour. So every hour, we take him over, he rings the bells, we go to the bathroom, uh, and then he comes back in. On day three, well, let me back up. The first two days, you are going to give him a treat every time he rings the bell and every time he goes to the bathroom. On day three, when we lengthen it to an hour, I am no longer going to give him a treat when he rings the bells. It's only when he goes to the bathroom. So the reward comes after he goes to the bathroom. I would stay at an hour uh, until you've had him a week. This just allows his bowels to get put back in order and the stress uh, to lessen, he's gonna decompress. Then over the next uh, couple weeks, you can lengthen it to two hours. For the first month, I would not go over two hours. Uh, I don't wanna push him too fast and have him regress. So some dogs jump up. He might just immediately start ringing the bells and only need to go out every two hours and he's just doing phenomenal. Uh, or he might need to stay at 30 minutes for two days. So if you, if you have him at 30 minutes, he's doing great. The next day you go to 45 and maybe he starts acting like he needs to go to the bathroom at 30 minutes. In the back of my mind, I'm going, uh, maybe I'll keep it shorter. I would rather be paranoid than have a dog start having accidents. So also I'm gonna look for signs that he needs to go. If he starts sniffing really heavily, which can be a tricky one with these dogs because he likes to sniff, uh, or if he starts panting or pacing, uh, you know, I'm gonna think maybe he needs to go to the bathroom, so I'll take him over to the bells, even if we've only been inside for 20 minutes. I would rather do that than have him have an accident. Or if he starts doing this little circle, at that point, just rush him out. Like I said, I'm a paranoid person as a dog trainer, and I don't think it's a bad thing for the next week for you to be a little bit paranoid. If in the back of your mind you think maybe he needs to go to the bathroom, just take him over and ring the bells. Don't push him and say, well, I'm gonna wait and see if he'll seek him out on his own. Uh, because once again, he's under the stress. It's a new environment, so help him out. Make sure that you train to success, not to failure. And as time goes on, after you get through this little bit of the transition, like I said, it could be two to four weeks, you'll start seeing him target the bells on his own uh, and you can give him a little bit more freedom. But if you give him too much freedom too quick, then you're just going to cause regression. Um, so freedom is earned, it's not a right. Now, if he does have an accident, I want it to be right in front of me uh, because then it gives me an opportunity to correct it. If he sneaks around the corner and has an accident and I find it five minutes later and an hour later, there's nothing I can do, that's my fault. That's me not paying attention to my dog. 100% supervision is a must. So that way, if he starts to have an accident, that's the meanest I get. No, 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 and I'm just gonna grab him and run him outside and then give him the opportunity to go. You can't correct him and then just shove him outside and start cleaning up. You have to go out with him because I am correcting you for peeing here, now I'm gonna rush you outside, and once you finish, once you keep peeing outside, then it's okay, good boy, and then I'm rewarding you for peeing here. That way I can make it as black and white as possible. Correct the incorrect behavior, reward the behavior I want. Whatever gets rewarded, gets repeated, right? So, um, now I'm gonna show you how to target the bells and I'm gonna take him out. So I'm gonna take your bully stick. Huh. Come on. So the first time that we ring bells in your home, they're gonna be off the door. So I'm gonna step on the leash, I'm gonna take a handful of treats and I'm just gonna hang the bells next to him. 
I'm not going to hit him with the bells. I'm just going to wait for him to ring them himself. Sometimes this takes a second, but I'm just going to stare at the bells and let him figure it out. We haven't had to do this little part of it for quite a while, so that's also why I'm going to be patient. Okay, good boy. So every time he touches them, he gets a treat. And I'm going to do this three or four times. So this is him seeing what's going to get my, nope, if he gets up, I'm going to bring him back. But he's trying to see what gets, my, gets a reaction. That's why he just touched my knee um, and leaned forward. Okay, good boy. But this is just, he's just got to process it. Okay, good boy. So we're going to do it one more time. You can see it's progressively getting a little quicker. Okay, good boy. So now I'm going to hang these bells on the door, and I'm not going to, I'm going to start emphasizing the word outside. So I'll let him ring them. Uh, I'm just going to stand here and stare. Okay, outside, good boy. Okay, outside, good boy. Have him ring it like three times, and then we're going to go outside. Okay, outside, good boy. Now that's what you're going to do every 30 minutes. So just take him up, have him ring the bells a couple times. Okay. When I'm outside, I'll give him a minute or two to sniff around and see if he needs to go. Periodically outside. He goes, he's going right now. I'll say, oh, boy, good boy. Give him a, and then we'll go right. If I thought that he might need to go number two, uh, I would just give him another minute or two to sniff around. Okay, good boy. I am not going to stay out there for more than two or three minutes, though. Good boy. Now, it is very important, like I said, the first two days, every time you take him up and he rings the bells, you give him a treat. But on day three, we stop that because I don't want a dog that just sits there and rings the bells to get a treat. I want him to understand that if he's going to ring the bells, it is uh, to go to the bathroom. So if you have any questions with the house training, don't hesitate uh, to give me a call. But I am going to, um, or we're going to cover his recall and uh, his off-leash walk, and then we'll go outside and do um, the long lead walk. So now we're going to talk about his recall and his long lead walks or off leash walks and some engagement. So we take them on, on these two different types of walks. So the attention walk is what we'll cover when we go outside. That's when I need his focus. It's a basic heel. Uh, as he gets a little bit older, start adding pressure and teach him a full heel. But right now I want it to be a positive walk, but I want his attention. And so even on an attention walk, I'll switch between that and a loose leash walk where he has a little bit more freedom like I said, we'll cover that outside. Uh, the other type of walk is the long lead or an off-leash walk. Until you know that he is going to return every time you call him to come, I keep him on the long lead. So right here I have um, my shortest long lead. This one's about 15 feet. Um, I have some that range all the way up to 100 feet. So I take these when I take a dog hiking. Uh, if you're going to use him for hiking quite a bit. Uh, as he gets a little bit older, I would e-collar condition him. That way you don't have to have him dragging this leash. Come here. Nope, we're not going outside. You can see that once you do that uh, exercise targeting the bells, now that's what he wants to do. He wants to ring them because uh, he knows that it's going to get a reaction. So this long lead as it's all tangled, is going to be your best friend. This is a way that I have control and I can really reinforce our recall command. So come as our recall command. Every time I call him to come, nope, I expect him to come back to me. You'll notice that uh, around here I haven't been saying come. I never use it in the house uh, because I don't want to burn it out. It's such an important command that I want to make sure that 
I keep that integrity. So in the house, good boy, I'll say like, come here, saps. Like it's an informal use. If he doesn't listen, I'm just gonna go and get him. Because in the house, I have control. He's not gonna run and go open the door and run outside. But you're not always gonna have <coughs> control outside. So he has a phenomenal recall, but practice it a lot. Take him on a long lead walk, and when I do this, he gets to be a dog. He's just running around playing, and every minute or two, I'm gonna call him to come just to give him a treat and let him go again. I'm gonna try and do that nine out of 10 times. That way it's super positive, and I have nine positive repetitions to the one repetition where I call him to come, and maybe we leave the park, or we're done, or we're going inside, or he has to go in a crate. Anything that could be potentially negative. So, when I call him to come, it's gonna be, Louie, come. I'm gonna be really clear, good boy, huh, good boy. That way he can um, focus in on me and he can understand the command. So I am gonna say his name first so that I get his attention. If he has his head down a hole or he's just hyper-focused on something running, he's not, gonna, he's not even gonna recognize that your voice is there sometimes. So that's why I wanna get his attention before I deliver that com command. Because if you're just yelling at him to come, at that point, you're getting frustrated. He doesn't even recognize you're yelling at him. And then you're gonna go and get him and you're gonna be all, all mad. And the worst thing that you can do is call your dog to come to then reprimand them. Anytime Louie comes to me, whether I had to go and get him uh, and I had to go 90% of the way there and then he came, but anytime he actively comes to me, I am gonna be happy to see my dog. The moment that you are mean or you correct him for coming to you, you have just damaged your relationship and he's not gonna to wanna to come. So um, I'm actually gonna widen this camera angle so that I can get a little bit more space and show you this recall command. <sighs> or I might just actually bring him over here. Uh, Louis is very much a Velcro dog. Like he likes to be with me. You can see that he's just following. Um, I'm gonna roll a treat, maybe that'll get him away. <gasps> So when I call him, I'm gonna have this long lead and I'm gonna say, here we go. Louie, come. Okay, good boy, good boy, good boy. And I'm gonna reward him as soon as he gets to me. Here we go. Louie, come. Okay, good boy. Uh, now, if he failed to come, if uh, he hesitated, anything like that, I'm gonna immediately give him, Louie, come. I'm gonna reel him in. Good boy, good boy. So I like to prepare for that. Louie, come. Okay, good boy. And I'll have that slack out of the leash. The other thing that I'll do is if there is a good distraction and he's looking like he might hesitate, is I will bend down like this. Because then I'm more rewarding. I'm exciting to come to me. Huh. Good boy. And as soon as he gets to me, he gets a treat, he gets pet. Uh, I want to make it very rewarding. I'm not gonna wait for a sit because I want to reward the actual um, motion, notion of coming to me. Here. Now, if he does fail, I'm just gonna go and get him. So if he was across the yard, I told him to come, and he looked at me and was like, eh, maybe not. Then I'm gonna tell him no, and I'm gonna walk and go and get him. Now, like I said, if I start after him, if he, if he ignored me and he was across there, I'd say, Louie, no. And if I walk towards him and I make it 90% of the way there, but he comes to me that last 10%, I will reward that. I'm gonna bury that anger deep down or that frustration and I'm gonna reward him. Now, if I did go 100% of the way there, I will tell him no and I will clip a leash on him and we will go. And then we will practice recall commands. <clears throat> he does not get away with disobeying me. That's where that follow through is so important. But if you were out on a walk and I don't know, something crazy happened and he just got hyper-focused and starts chasing after this deer and you know that he's just blocked you out, he's just focused on that deer, I'm not gonna sit there and yell at him to come. Instead, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna go and get him, okay? There's no sense in screaming at him because it's just gonna cause more frustration and you're gonna lose the integrity of that command. So same thing if you're at home and you just, he's running around in the yard, if you open the door and you want him to come and you call him to come and he ignores you, doesn't matter what the weather's like or what the reasoning, you have to go and get your dog at that point. 
the moment that you say, oh, I'll go get him in a second, then he's thinking, oh, apparently I don't have to listen to that command. So Louis is very smart and he will tear that command apart if you're not consistent. And that's why I say if you're going to have him as a, a pretty good hiking companion, use an e-collar. Uh, they're, very, they're a very, very useful tool. So, um, Also, the person that calls him is the one to go and get him. Uh, you can't have three or four people calling him. You only need one person, and then we're going to go and get him. So, Now, if you are on a hike or a walk and you encounter something that is very distracting and he kind of gets focused on it, but you have him on a leash, this is where I'll focus on engagement. So I do this a lot with my dogs when we're on the trail uh, and another dog comes up or there's a moose or something that they get focused on. Uh, so what engagement is, is I'm just making him pay attention to me and ignore the distraction around. So what that looks like is if there was a, a distraction over here and he was focused on it, I would call him, I would put my back towards the distraction, and then I'm going to jackpot reward him. So I'll just, okay, good boy, good boy, Louie, okay. Might even use the watch me command here. So when I use that, I'll watch me. Okay, there we go. I'm waiting for his eyes to shift over. Uh, he doesn't have to move his whole head. I just waited for eye contact. Watch me. Okay, good boy, good boy. Yes, good boy. So this way I'm, I'm directing his eyes towards me. Watch me. Okay, if he's just staring at my hand, then I'll, I'll just bring that up. But what I'm doing here is I'm making myself positive. I'm exciting. I'm giving him treats. It's rewarding. And I'm making it so that he forgets about the distraction behind me. Good boy. So I'll do this on a walk or, like I said, out on the trail. If another person with the dog's coming up, I'm just going to come here. Step to the side of the trail, put my back towards him, have him say, okay, good boy, okay, good boy. Okay, good boy. Work on watch me, but I'm just engaging with him to the point where it's way too positive to watch me, um, or it's way more exciting to watch me than the distraction. Okay, good boy. So do this a lot on walks. Anytime that you see a distraction and he gets reactive, engage with him. So... But now we're gonna walk outside and we're gonna do his attention walk. So, let's go. All right, so our attention walk uh, is when I want him focused, he's looking up at me and he's not pulling. So anytime I start this walk, I expect him to start in a sit like this. Good boy. And then I'll tell him, let's go. Let's go signifies that we're moving. If he starts to pull, I tell him easy and pop the leash. Now, I will also, you'll see, we only have a four foot leash here, but I wrap that. I only give him maybe a foot and a half, two feet, because I want a quick correction in this situation if he starts to pull. And you'll also see me use a little bit of leash pressure. I'm not correcting him, but I'm directing him with that. So I'm just gonna tell him, uh, let's go, we'll start walking. And you can see the way that he looks up at me, where he's standing, how he's responding. Let's go. Want him by my side. Good boy, periodically looking up at me. Let's go. I'll tell him let's go when we turn around or turn corners. I don't care that he's half a step ahead of me, but he has to pay attention. Let's go. When I turn, I can give him just a little bit of leash pressure. Let's go. But I expect him to follow along. When I stop, he stops and sits. Good boy. If he started to pull, Let's go. I'd tell him, easy, pop, pop. And I'd take a few steps back, bring him back to attention, and then we can keep going. He is never allowed to get to a distraction or something down the road if he is pulling. So if I tell him easy, and he doesn't immediately turn around and put the slack back in the leash, I said, I'll stop, I'll take a few steps back. I never keep going forward. If he was really persistent on going forward and getting to that distraction, then I would stop, I'd tell him, let's go, and I'd turn the opposite direction. As soon as he regains his focus, I'd turn around, walk back towards the distraction. If he starts to pull, it's the same thing. So I'll go back and forth, back and forth. I'll just say, let's go. So if we got distracted, it'd be, nope, let's go. We turn around, he focuses, let's go. We're just going back and forth. Good dog, good dog. 
I'm rewarding him when he does focus on me, giving him lots of information. Um, the other thing, now he's a pointer, he's going to want to sniff. You're not going to be able to get rid of that. So this attention walk is going to be more for if you're out in public, you need uh, his attention real quick while you get through a crowded place or something with heavy distractions. But with my dogs, I like a loose leash walk or I'm just gonna go on a long leader and off leash walk because they are bred to hunt. He is going to put his nose to the ground. If you don't like that behavior, he got the wrong dog. So I am going to, like I said, switch off, let him do a loose leash walk, let him have a little bit more freedom. Uh, the attention walk is when I need focus. Oh, good boy, good boy. Uh, the other thing is even though I have this leash wrapped up, my arm's still relaxed. You don't want to be t tight. You don't want this tension through the leash because he can feel that and that, that sends a message of anxiety right there. And so he's not going to be able to relax. You're not going to have an enjoyable walk. So I want this relaxed uh, leash and I want it to be fun and enjoyable. Also, as he gets older, use treats. You don't know what's going to happen on a walk. You don't know where he's going to get uh, reactive or what he's going to get overreactive with and the stress so the next couple weeks to month he is going to be anxious because he's stressed out so make sure that you start off by walking in an area with the least amount of distractions as possible focus on it being positive and building a relationship with him so once again it should just look just like this let's go good boy good boy reward him for looking at you if he doesn't look at you, you can use watch me, you can use good boy, good boy. But I want a nice, easy walk. And even if he gets half a step ahead of you, you can just give a little bit of leash pressure and slow down. He'll match your pace. Let's go. So if I start moving quicker, he's going to move quicker. Good dog, good dog. If I go slower, he should go slower. Huh? But he's not allowed to walk in front of me. Good boy. So once again, if you have any questions with anything at all, let me know. Uh, Louie's awesome. I love him. He's such a good dog. Very handsome. Uh, I've enjoyed training him, so thank you for that. And uh, like I said, any questions at all, let me know. Uh, thanks.